Owing to what only can be described as a colossal fuck-up by its original theatrical distributor, George A. Romero and John Russo's 1968 zombie classic Night of the Living Dead is in the public domain, which is to say that it exists outside of copyright, which means anybody, you or I, can remake, re-release or distribute the film without any legal repercussions whatsoever. Don't expect any zombies in these links. We're not made of money, and we don't have any mates. The 1990 remake of Night of the Living Dead was written and produced by Romero and directed by Tom Savini. Savini, mostly known for his effects work, and a long-time friend of George, was initially set to create the effects for the 1968 original. Instead, he was drafted to serve in the Vietnam War just before shooting started. After he returned, suitably traumatised by the horrific shit he had seen while serving as a combat photographer, he eventually began his long and fruitful collaboration with George in 1978's Martin. Having continued his Dead series with Dawn in 1978 and Day in 1985, Romero contacted Menahem Golan, formerly of Canon and of 21st Century Films, with a view to collaborating on a remake of Night, partially to prevent an unauthorised remake going ahead without its involvement. He wrote the script himself and appointed Savini to direct. It would seem that Savini had a number of his own ideas that he wanted to contribute to the story that were curtailed by the producers at 21st Century Film, as Romero himself was generally not on set, and he was forced to make a film that was largely similar to the original. So far, so Wikipedia. Sorry about that. Here's some original content. <laughs> Original content! <laughs> Hashtag handstand! <laughs> In the last few years, Night of the Living Dead 1990 has had a critical reappraisal. Those who've watched it recently or saw it initially on home video seem to enjoy it a lot more than the critics at the time, who were not impressed to say the least. Some say it was a crass and cynical attempt to cash in on a classic. Others that it was simply a shot for shot retread of the original. Roger Ebert gave it one star out of five, suggesting that Romero ripped off himself and complained that the characters are unlikable. That's bullshit if you ask me. The latter part is the point, and it's a device that Romero used in his own zombie films time and time again. I know Roger Ebert passed away some time ago and isn't here to defend himself, so I have to make it clear that I have no intention of disrespecting the dead. For my part, I fell in love with the film when I first saw it in VHS. Romero deliberately inserts left turns into the script that sporadically reconfigures the narrative and characters, taking you into uncharted waters, if somewhat briefly. From the very start, your knowledge is tested. This begins in the very first scene, whereas previously Bill Hinsman's cemetery zombie appeared to the audience and to Barbara as a normal man, only to then attack them, the opening of this film turns that on its ear. The same scene plays out with a dishevelled and bloodied, though very much alive, funeral guest shambling towards us only for a hideously decayed zombie to smash into frame from the left, taking us unaware. This occurs throughout. The original sequence of events is reshaped, and your familiarity with the original film is tested, and you're challenged to pay attention unless you miss something new. It's the classic magician's trick of misdirection. This carries on all the way through to the very end, where the notoriously nihilistic and downbeat ending of the original is replaced with something that may not be as shocking or as bleak, but serves to underscore the change in Barbara's character and drive home one of the series' key messages. People are arseholes. As alluded to earlier, Savini often refers to himself as a magician, and in this film that's applied to subverting audience expectations. Obviously, for the most part, he's referring to his work as a special effects artist. As you might expect, this film has a strong focus on special effects work. Being in the director's chair, though, Savini didn't manage the special effects and makeup directly, instead delegating to a team. Having already worked on Dawn and Day, not to mention two Friday the 13th films at this point, it seems he was already jaded with zombies, which puts him a good 30 years ahead of the rest of us, and was determined to make zombies scary again. From a practical standpoint, he and his team chose to focus on the concept of death itself, something the film emphasises through its various makeup effects and how particular zombies are covered. It's an excellent conceit that demonstrates the power of giving a special effects artist, THE special effects artist, in my opinion, the director's chair. Rather than looking at previous depictions of zombies in cinema, they instead looked at actual autopsies and photographs of real corpses. 
This is why these zombies have a jaundiced complexion and milky eyes. They're based on actual observations of human death and decay, something that's been hugely influential in subsequent depictions of the living dead. This film is inveterately morbid. The visual horror focuses on the grisly details of certain zombies' deaths. One is a drug addict, for example. Another's been stabbed. In the film's first scene, we see what appears to be a healthy man who is then revealed to have been recently embalmed and autopsied. It's effects such as these that really trade on the uncanny effect of the living dead, something that seems to have been lost in a lot of more recent films. It's not just the effects work. I'd say the filmmaking here, especially for the budget, is pretty exceptional. The lighting is moody and evocative of a full moon in twilight, the moon being a repeated motif. Frank Prinzi's lighting is sharp and noirish, backlit dialogue scenes picking up details on characters' faces. The cool moonlight contrasts with the warm oranges of fire and explosions in key moments. Open fields and grasslands are floodlit with cool moonlight tones, creating an otherworldly feel. The house in the original film isn't particularly well covered as a space, possibly owing to necessity more than anything else. This isn't the case here. The house itself feels more open, and we're given a better feel for its geography through camera placement. The division between upstairs and the basement is clearer than ever, and it actually feels as if we're following the characters through the space. This allows us to experience the art design on offer, as the house is peppered with imagery that evokes hunting, taxidermy, and by extension, death. The soundtrack by Paul McCullough is a big departure from the Capitol Library music sourced by Carl Hardman for the original film, which you can hear in the background of this very video. It may not be to everybody's tastes, but I like it a lot. Creepy synths lurk in the background and driving drums and guitar riffs are amped up when the on-screen action requires it. It is, in some places, reminiscent of the score to the 1968 film, and in others determined to do its own thing, with a few jangly piano keys and string sounds thrown in among the electronic instrumentations. But remember, this isn't your granny's not nottled not not nottled not null nottled. This isn't your granny nottled. <laughs> <laughs> the human characters are at the heart of the Romero zombie film, and this one is no exception. The recast and reconfigured characters are what make this version interesting. Patricia Tolman, Tony Todd and Tom Tolles fill in the roles of Barbara, Ben and Cooper respectively, the most important triptych in the film. Ben takes something of a backseat in this version. I personally cannot think of a better choice than Tony Todd to fill in for the late Dwayne Jones. Both men portray the character as a likeable everyman prone to moments of theatrical gravity, and both are equally luckless in the grand scheme of things. I'll let you decide which one gets it worse. Todd's Ben is arguably the more human of the two though. If you take time to break down his decision throughout, he's consistently wrong. Wrong about staying upstairs, wrong about the TV, wrong about going for the truck. Todd still makes him likeable in spite of this though, and it's his humanity that shines through. Tom Tolles, probably best known as Otis from Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer, gives a much less restrained performance than Carl Harbin in the original film. Which is a polite way of saying he's great at being a total fucking prick. Whilst the original Cooper is definitely a belligerent ass, he's more flawed and bullish than outwardly villainous. This version is arrogant, rude, violent and abusive towards his wife. Tolls chooses scenery throughout, really complimenting Todd's more grounded performance. I also think he looks like a boggling Ted Danson, but that's just me. One of the most significant revisions is in the characterization of Barbara. Patricia Tolman's genre credentials are extensive. Having worked with Romero previously as a stunt performer in Knight Riders, Creepshow 2 and Monkey Shines, she also had a guest starring role in Tales from the Dark Side, not to mention her credits in Star Trek and Babylon 5. The new script retools Barbara for a post Sarah Connor, post Ellen Ripley audience. Whilst the original film used Psycho's trick of introducing a protagonist in the first act, only to kill them off to then switch focus to another, the remake allows Ben and Barbara to share focus as leads of the film. In the original film, Judith O'Dee's Barbara is reduced to a simpering catatonic mess fairly early on. In yet another piece of misdirection, Tolman's Barbara is introduced as downtrodden and easily bullied by Bill Mosley's Johnny. Her outfit codes her as a secretarial type in a way that is eerily similar to Jamie Lee Curtis in True Lies a few years later, and her transformation occurs in a similar fashion. Rather than crumbling, this Barbara gains strength as the film wears on. She's able to have agency in and direct the group's plans, speak for herself, and by the end become a gun-toting, philosophical zombie smasher. In disguising Patricia Tolman, the accomplished and storage stunt performer, as a dowdy secretary and trading on our knowledge of the previous film, Savini and Romero pull yet another bait and switch by reconfiguring the character, her place in the film, and the energy of the central relationships within it. In the Romero zombie films, the characters and their conflicts drive the narrative, not the zombies, and now Barbara is a key part of that. It's like The Walking Dead, except it isn't a 70 hour long Saturday morning cartoon written by cretins. <laughs> <laughs> what might appear as a one-to-one -one remake to some is anything but. The devil's in the detail with this one. It's all about the cumulative effect of a number of minor changes adding up to a technically accomplished, well-acted and worthy entry in the series with an ultimately different feel. 
somehow adding layers of morbidity to what was already an incredibly morbid cycle of films. Savini and Romero used the magician's trick of misdirection to pull the wool over your eyes and keep you guessing until the very end. If you've seen it before and didn't like it, I implore you to give it another go, and if you've never seen it at all, go in with an open mind, even if I did just spoil most of it for you. It's on, it's on. There's no sound. The Living Dead 1990 is available on streaming and physical media now and you can check out the original version on YouTube where it's been uploaded in different flavours and definitions and recoloured versions and all sorts. As you may have noticed uh, we actually filmed these li the links for this piece about two years ago and it was originally supposed to be a two-part thing where I was going to cover uh, the John Russo kind of director's cut version of the film of the original film as well but that's probably unlikely with things being as they are so I kind of retooled it into this. And I'd like to thank Duncan uh, who Oi! Pay, att pay attention, love. How hard is it? Rude. Fucking unbelievable. Uh, I'd like to thank Duncan for uh, helping me out for a day and then not saying anything when I sat on all the footage for two years and didn't use it. Um, so once again, thanks very much. Like, subscribe. See you next time. Bye. Thank you.